So let's take a little look at a timeline of antibiotics and consider when the antibiotics were introduced and where we found resistance to them. So the first antibiotic was introduced in 1938, and that's a penicillin, of course. And how long do you think it was before resistance to penicillin was found? In fact, by 1945, we had resistance to penicillin. Penicillin only lasted about seven years before there were resistant bacteria. Penicillin, by the way, is a beta-lactam. But that's okay, because in 1946, we had streptomycin, and it was introduced. Streptomycin is an amino glycoside, and as you'll remember, there's lots of ways that you can gain resistance to amino glycosides. And so how long do you think it was until there was resistance to amino glycosides, to streptomycin? In fact, 1946, we had resistance to streptomycin. But that's okay, because in 1948, we introduced chloramphenicol. And so, as we're introducing antibiotics, bacteria are introducing resistance. And in fact, chlorophenicol lasted pretty well. It wasn't until 1950 that we had resistance to chloramphenicol. The story keeps going. In 1951, we introduced erythromycin. Erythromycin actually lasted quite a long time. It wasn't until 1955 that we had resistance to erythromycin. In 1958, we introduced two amino uh, two antibiotics, rifampicin, still used as a primary treatment for um, Mycobacterium tuberculosis infections, for example, and vancomycin. Vancomycin lasted until 1960, and rifampicin lasted until 1962. Oh, and then one more that we introduced in 1958, we introduced methicillin, and methicillin is really um, an important drug in the fight against a bacteria called Staph aureus. Staph aureus is a common bacteria. It's in our, on our skin, in our noses. Um, it, everybody has it. But occasionally, Staph aureus can go really bad. And in 1962, again, we identified methicillin-resistant Staph aureus, MRSA. So we had kind of the golden age of antibiotics, where we got a lot of antibiotics introduced. And then in, we had a bit of a gap before the next antibiotic introduced in 1968, when we introduced ciprofloxacin. This was a, a new kind of antibiotic called a quinolone, and people predicted that we would never get resistance to quinolones. It would be impossible. And so it wasn't until um, 1968 that we identified resistance to ciprofloxacin. Oops. Lots of antibiotics, bit of a gap, 1958 to 1968. The next antibiotic was introduced, wasn't until 2000. So in 2000, linzolid was introduced. Again, a new type of antibiotic, would never find resistance to it. 2001, resistant linzolid. 2003, about the last antibiotic introduced, it's called daptomycin, 2003. And when was in resistance to daptomycin discovered? It was introduced 15 years ago. Do you think we're lucky we still haven't found resistance to it? Yeah, no, sorry. Daptomycin resistance was actually discovered in 1987, even though daptomycin wasn't introduced as an antibiotic until 2003. It turns out daptomycin was actually discovered in 1986, 
And then um, it took a while for it to be developed and, and released as a clinical antibiotic. Um, and so that's why we knew about resistance then. So there's two things that you need to understand here. The first is that we had a period from 1938 to 1958 of 20 years where we rapidly introduced new antibiotics. But since 1958, in the last 60 years, we really haven't introduced any new antibiotics, just a few, a handful. And that's one of the big problems, is that we're not developing new antibiotics because it's hard to find targets that affect bacteria but don't affect humans. The other thing that you need to realize is that as soon as we release an antibiotic, we can identify resistance in bacteria. And there's a couple of reasons for this. One is that it's really uh, easy to gain resistance. There are many different mechanisms. As I mentioned, you can break down the antibiotic. You can secrete it from the cell. You can stop it coming into the cell. There's a lot of different ways that bacteria can become resistant to antibiotics. And the third reason that bacteria can become resistant to antibiotics is that pretty much all of these antibiotics are natural products. So we don't actually dream up some chemistry and come up with an antibiotic. The way that we typically find antibiotics, the way that antibiotics were found in the beginning by Fleming, was he noticed that something was growing and exuding a compound, and that was killing the bacteria. And it's the same thing, the same way that we find all of these other antibiotics, is that we screen through other organisms and see how they kill bacteria. We isolate the compounds, maybe we modify them slightly, we fluorinate them or brominate them, but basically they're all natural products. And they're not natural products that were designed to help us live longer. They were natural products that are designed to make one organism kill another so that it can grow better. The one that produces the antibiotic can grow be better than the one that succumbs to it. It's a warfare that's been going on for many millions of years. We're just tapping into that and using the antibiotics for our own benefit. But of course the bacteria aren't just sitting there saying, oh no, there's an antibiotic, kill me. They're saying, no, screw off, man. I don't want your antibiotic. I'm quite happy living here. You can produce that all you want. I'm resistant to it. So there's a very strong selective pressure for bacteria to develop resistant to antibiotics. And this has been happening for a really long time. We're just at one end of it, tapping in, using these antibiotics. But the bacteria don't care. They've got resistance mechanisms. And they can share their resistance mechanisms very easily. So this is a real problem. Antibiotic resistance is a real problem. And there are really a few things that we can do to try and overcome the rise of antibiotic resistance. The most important thing that you can do is to decrease the use of antibiotics. If you don't need antibiotics, don't take them. And there's lots of things where antibiotics aren't called for. If you have influenza, antibiotics kill bacteria. They don't kill viruses. Antibiotics kill bacteria. They do not kill viruses. If you have influenza, you don't normally need antibiotics. There's an asterisk, a caveat to that, which is that if your influenza is associated with a bacterial infection, then you need antibiotics. But if it's just the influenza, you don't need it. If you have the common cold, you don't need antibiotics. If we can reduce the amount of antibiotics we're using, not just in our own health, but also in agricultural purposes, in other purposes, veterinary purposes, things like that, then we can slow down the rise in resistant bacteria. The second thing that's actually really important when you do have antibiotics is to make sure that you finish the course. So take all of the antibiotics. And the reason is that if you have, if you start taking some antibiotics and you don't finish the course, it will kill off some of the bacteria but if there's anything that's resistant to anything, 
that's similar to what you're taking, it allows for those mutations to be to happen, to accrue, to pick up, and so now we've got new resistant bacteria. So finishing the course of antibiotics is actually quite an important uh, lesson. And then the third thing, which is not something that you can necessarily do um, at home, but the thing that we need to do is we need to identify new targets for antibiotics, and we need to new identify new compounds, new chemicals, that we can use as antibiotics so that we're not limited to the antibiotics that we've produced over the last few years. We've got new antibiotics that are coming in.